Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first official webinar. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share some slides. And what we'll be going over today is a brand new piece of functionality, an, an all new system that we're calling the Visit Widget Command Console and a handful of other really cool items that we've been working on. So we'll start out with a quick agenda. Uh, we're going to start out with some intros, just uh, some hellos and let you guys know who we are if you haven't met us yet. And then we're going to dive into the all new command console. And really the idea behind the command console was we wanted to give clients more control over all of the features and functionality within the widget uh, and their apps and the kiosk. And it's really expanding the capabilities that everyone will have to manage their systems without always having to interface with a visit widget account manager. Uh, and it will grow substantially over time. And I'll give you a sneak peek at some of the stuff that's coming. Uh, additionally, we've got some really cool roadmap features that we're building out. And we used an all new design process to really make some data driven decisions to have maximized improvement for the end user experience that we'll be covering. Uh, questions can be answered at any time during the webinar today. Uh, you can basically pop them into the chat and we'll pause every once in a while within each section to try to uh, get answers for any questions that come up. And then lastly, we'll be covering uh, Nate, who's joining us today. We'll be covering uh, event calendar, um, basically automated event sourcing through his company, Occasion Genius. And we've worked with him on numerous accounts and uh, really see a lot of benefit uh, derived from relying on the auto sourcing for events to keep the calendar populated. So we'll go ahead and jump into some intros. This is Eric. I'm the co-founder and product manager of Visit Widget. And I started building this platform back in 2014 uh, in a small storage closet and officially launched it in 2016. And we're currently partnered with over 350 destinations around the world. So the ask here was for everybody to add a photo of their traveling experience somewhere. And this is me with family having some good wine after playing some golf uh, in the mountains of New Mexico. Justin. Hey, y'all. My name is uh, Justin. I am the director of marketing here at Visit Widget, and I've been, uh, many of you uh, have been your account manager as well. And this is me in Montepucciano, Italy, and I don't know the name of that cat. <laughs> awesome. Katie. Hello. Some of you may already know me. I'm Katie. I've been an account manager at Visit Widget for almost a year now. This is a photo of me climbing in the five open books area of Yosemite. Awesome. And Nate. Nice to meet everyone. Uh, Nate Marcus, a founder of Occasion Genius. Uh, this is outside of Angkor Wat. They call it the Indiana Jones Temple. They've left it as it has been found. So it's a lot of fun. Awesome. And then, uh, unfortunately, last minute, Jen was not able to join us. She's on jury duty, but she did supply a photo of her with a horse that she um, got to ride on a, in a safari in Africa. So we'll go ahead and jump into it, and I'm going to pull up my notes on the right-hand side of my screen. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a completely new tool that we've developed, and it does encompass the existing analytics dashboard, but it exposes a lot more configuration options for you. And so one of the reasons that, um, well, this now includes two-factor authentication, and we really wanted to make sure that all of the data uh, and you know, capabilities were secure. And so when you log into this, and we'll basically have a link inside the widget, as well as we can provide you, you know, the URL to access the uh, command console, um, we wanted to make sure that you know, people would are definitely authenticated correctly in order to be able to send push notifications, in order to be able to view user data and all the new things that we're exposing here. So you'll receive an email once you go in to authenticate, and uh, it'll get you a six digit pin. And this will automatically default to the analytics dashboard, the one that everyone is familiar with today, showing all of your usage across the different platforms. There is some new navigation here um, where basically you've got a platform drop down selector where you can either change from all platforms or just into the widget, desktop version, mobile, and just in the apps uh, combined iOS or Android. And coming soon to this uh, will also be the kiosk analytics on a per unit basis. And that will be exposed in this drop down for any clients that are taking advantage of our kiosks. Additionally, some things that are coming down the pipeline for the analytics dashboard is we are adding uh, benchmarking. So you'll be able to make comparisons against previous timeframes to see how usage is trending now versus this time last year. 
Uh, we're also adding the passport check-in data. So you'll be able to see all the check-ins and completions and which places are getting checked in at the most and what time. Uh, we're adding the kiosk analytics, I already said, the number of plans created per time frame. So you'll actually see how often plans are being created for your destination. We're adding the number of arrivals per time frame. Um, and that's just basically using a geofence around each client destination to determine with, when someone actually arrives uh, in the destination. And from that, we can also derive the dwell time, how long their average stay time frame is. So this is um, yeah, the current version of the analytics dashboard um, built into the command console. And one thing to note is the date picker has moved to the right-hand side. You still have all the ability to view popular items, add unit performance, and of course, export any of your analytics to CSV format. So I'll pause there. Were there any questions in the chat on the analytics dashboard? And I believe you have to use the Q&A function, uh, which would be the second button over. It would be, okay, so let's say it would be the MetroClick kiosk that show on the kiosk usage page. Um, so any of your kiosks, regardless of which vendor you're going to be using, the analytics are tracked the same. So you're going to see those uh, within the uh, the analytics drop down there uh, when you select kiosk. Good yep. question, Megan. Perfect. Uh, any anyone else have any other questions before we move on? Give it a couple seconds here. Is the geofence an additional cost? So geofencing is included on the pro plan. Uh, we do offer ways to add it to the other plans, both basic and uh, and the plus plan for not everything that comes in the pro plan. So uh, just reach out to your account manager to talk about what that monthly fee looks like, but it does enable you to all, also take advantage of proximity messaging when the geofencing is enabled. Ms. Joanne up in Golden, British Columbia, will arrivals into destination exclude pass through traffic? Hey, Joanne. So we'll basically have a setting to determine what dictates an arrival. And if that's some, you know, a certain amount of hours or days, uh, we can configure that on a per client basis. Perfect. I'm not seeing any other questions come in, but we'll keep monitoring that just in case. Perfect. All right, so Justin, take us through the content section. All righty, so the content section. So this obviously looks a lot different. You've seen the analytics dashboard before, even though there's a lot of new stuff to it, but the content section, this is totally different than what we've had before. And we're super excited about it. Um, our dev team has been hard at work along with our design team and everybody's been working really hard to make sure you have a great experience here. So we'll kind of go through everything you can do. First thing I want Eric to do is go over to this side panel here in the maroon and you'll see all of your menu items. You can easily drag and drop the order of those menu items. Justin, why would I want to drag and drop the order of the menu items? Well, let's say you're running a new passport, right? You got a margarita trail, taco trail, shrimp passport, I don't know, whatever it is. And you want that to be the very first thing people see whenever they get onto the app. Let's go ahead and drag that to the top, just like Eric did. We can also click over into open widget to see those, those changes happening in real time. So you want to make sure that that change happened. You can always click that button. And you'll see experiences move from, I think, the third position to the top position there. And go back over for me, Eric. So within the <clears throat> uh, menu item itself, you can click into it and you'll see the actual menu item is entirely editable. So if you want to change the name, maybe we change it to passports. You can easily change that name. A couple other things you can do is at the top over here, you've got an option to have enabled or disabled. So if you were working with that passport and then it expired, so let's say you're running it for a set period of time, you can toggle it off or toggle it back on, and that'll make it visible to the public or not visible to the public. Yeah, we already talked about adjusting the label, but you can also adjust the iconography. Uh, one bit of advice here is work with a graphic designer because you want all of your iconography to look the same. So, uh, or I typically do, maybe that's just me being a little OCD, but you can always click on that. You can upload it and it'll give you some advice as to what sizes you want to do there um, to, to, you know, to implement that, to ensure that it's the correct size. So you're going to have an enabled and a disabled. So an active and an inactive icon. So you'll see that's why there's two different uh two different options there to load those up into. You also have the option to publish in certain uh, platforms. So do we want it on the widget? Do we want it on the app? Do we want it on the kiosks? In this example, we're looking at a passport and probably doesn't make sense to have it on the widget or the kiosk because you can't really participate in a passport on a the uh, on the desktop version. Um, you know, it's not like people are walking around with their last laptops trying to participate anyway. So we're only going to have that published on the app. 
A couple other things is on the right hand side, you're going to notice your categories. So you can always go in and you can reorder your categories if you want to drag and drop those to adjust the order in which those categories appear. Uh, you can also go in and click and adjust on the pencil there. Thanks, Eric. Uh, you can adjust the name of this. So if you want to, you know, maybe say 21 plus or adults only or whatever you want to put in there, you can adjust that. And you can adjust the colors. So you can use a custom color or you can use that primary color that was your default color. So if Eric clicks on that, let's say we pick uh, maybe an orange or something there, drag it over, whatever you want to do. You can always adjust the color. Now you'll look at the bottom. A lot of you have great branding guidelines. I'm sorry, Eric, I just want to show one more thing. If you can click on the color for me. A lot of you have great branding guidelines, so don't feel like you have to guess which color. You can just drop the hex value in there or one of the other options if that's a little bit easier for you to type that in. So uh, I always prefer doing that. Uh, the next option here is to select an icon. So you'll see some icons here. We do have an icon library. Um, so you can kind of go in and, you know, let's say we're, there we go. Good example, wine 21 and up. You can search the icon library for that SVG. You also have the option to upload your own SVG. There's a great tool that we utilize that we have uh, access to called Flat Icon, and that's where the vast majority of these come from. But if you go and find something from a tool like Flat Icon, download, <clears throat> download that SVG. We always recommend it is in white. That's the color that we always go to as our default for every single one of you. And you can upload that in there. And there's another... Uh, once you've made your correct uh, selections, actually, make sure you're going to go ahead and hit save because we want to save everything and you want to hit the save at the top. So all those adjustments have been made and will be reflected over in the widget. Um, and then a couple other options here that you're going to see is the ability to select category categories. So bulk edit uh, your category uh, colors. So you can go in here and you can select multiples and you can adjust the colors. When some of our clients have a lot of categories, they will break them up based on color groups or um, for various reasons, we see different uh, different categories within the same menu or primary category having different color values. So you can kind of do the bulk adjustment to where you have the first four is blue and the next four is green and so on and so forth as you see fit. And then again, of course, always clicking save to make sure we have uh, saved all that. On the left-hand side, we've got links. So what are links? <clears throat> uh, these are things that y'all have reached out to, to ask us to implement for you. So maybe it's a chat button or maybe it's a, um, I don't know, maybe you have a little league baseball tournament coming to town and you wanna provide information for the parents um, with a great landing page on, let's say your website that gives them a lot of information about the tournament or maybe it's purchasing tickets to an upcoming event, something like that. You can go in, you can easily get these uh, added in there for yourselves, and then you can adjust the labels, adjust the URL, and also adjust the iconography and choose the platform to where it is published. I do want to say that uh, editing these is immediately available, and we are adding the ability uh, probably within the next week or so to actually create those links. So you will have total control to be able to do all that. And that wraps up. I think I covered it all, right, Eric? Yeah, the one thing I want to add on to that is, you know, this is a V1 of the command console and coming soon and what the dev team is currently working on is actually adding all listing and event tour challenge goal management to this system. Um, there's a lot of reasoning behind that, one of which is we want to make sure the widget performs optimally its primary function of helping visitors discover the area and plan a trip. And so it doesn't need a lot of all the extra functionality that is embedded in the admin mode functionality. And so that will be moving into this system over time. And I do have, you know, we don't have it actually built out fully yet, but we do have a couple of views here to show you that the content section will be expanded to include all of your listings, all of the events, all of the tours, challenges, and a very intuitive WYSIWYG editor to you know, populate all of the content that's necessary. If you're taking advantage of translations, you'll be able to append translated content for each section, and you get a nice preview of exactly how that listing is going to look once that information has been added. Additionally, the content section will include the ability for clients to actually manage their action bar further than ever before. 
So if, you know, if there's a place to get tickets for the Jacksonville Zoo, you can add an action button that says get tickets and upload the icon that you want. You'll be able to assign categories to each entity. You'll be able to uh, manage either the singular cover photo or images within the photo gallery for each entity. And then you'll also be able to set check-in parameters if this particular place is on a, um, a check-in challenge. So just a quick peek at where this is going. Like I said, the V1 is everything that Justin showcased today, and uh, you will see this grow over time uh, with a lot more functionality. So we did have a question come in, Eric. It's from Jeff with uh, Texas Wine Lover, and it says, I may have missed it, but can new menu and link items be added? I don't see a create new or add icon button. I think you kind of just answered that. Um, but yes, Jeff, that is in the pipeline to be added. It's just not available right now in V1, um, but we will have that uh, in the very near future. And the, some of the complexity there, Jeff, is adding a new client link is pretty easy. So you'll be easily to jump in and create new ones there. But when you create a new menu item in the system, it has to get data source categories assigned to it from where we're syncing from. So the overall UI design is taking a little bit longer to come up with the creation of new menu item icons. Great question, though. Yeah. Okay. Jason with Hershey Harrisburg. Uh, for content that is updated through WYSIW, that's a tough YG interface. What, okay. <laughs> what happens when the original date is updated in our CRM? Is there an option to ignore or automatically pull in CRM updates? So what we have planned for uh, previously synced data is actually to display in the command console what items are being managed from the source and what parameters can still be modified in our system. So for example, you're seeing um, uh, this is a state in which the Zach Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens was pulled in via the sink. And so you really wanna go back to the source to update the title of that item, the description and the address. But in our system, you would be able to append translations. You could add the average time spent. You could include additional action bar items. Um, if you wanted to edit the phone number or the website, you would go back to the source. And then you can append additional categories and you'll see the ones that are, are coming in from the sync settings. Okay, so Ms. Kim, uh, if we use a simple view API, will the action button stay in place with each overnight update? Correct, yeah. In some cases, if you've got a, if we're using simple view CRM, there are already additional URLs that we're syncing in, like if an accommodation has a booking URL. But if you don't have those, um, and let's say you wanted to add one here, you'll see the buttons that are synced in coming from the data source, not in a non-edible format. And then you can go and add an additional button that will, will persist even if the sync runs once or a thousand times. Yep. And um, and that's a, a good question. I think one of the reasons why you asked us, we always say don't make changes to listings um, because the, we do consider your CRM or website, the source of truth. And while that is true, that's, that's really just very particular stuff like the descriptions, phone numbers, stuff like that, um, where we're syncing that in from CRM. So, um, any of these additional items and stuff are, are entirely edible within the platform and they will persist and maintain. Right. Good questions. We'll go ahead and move on to the messaging section. So <clears throat> gone are the days of having to keep up with one signals uh, updates where we have to keep retraining everyone on how to use a new UI they've come out with. So basically one signal's not going away. You'll still have all of your messages there and we're just using the one signal API to allow you to create and modify messages in our system and then they're delivered to one signal to be distributed to users. So what you're seeing here within the, the messaging section is basically I've got a couple delivered messages so I can see when these went out. One thing that's coming soon is the actual analytics. So the amount of click throughs and impressions and deliveries for each of the messages that you've sent in the past. And then you've got a, a scheduled tab. So any of the messages that you have upcoming and you'll notice on, on any of these, when I'm under scheduled, I can click the three dots. You've got the option to edit a scheduled message. You can duplicate it and then modify the contents, or you can delete it if the event was canceled. If you go to delivered and you select one of these, it's basically just gonna give you the option to duplicate it because those messages were already sent out. And if you click into one, you do see the full contents of the message and everything that was configured. Let's go ahead and start from scratch and create a new message. 
And you'll see here um, some pretty similar fields, but a much more simplistic UI than what, uh, what you typically see in the one signal interface. So you'll go ahead and wanna uh, pop in a title for your message, the body content for your message. And as always, we do recommend using fun emojis because um, you know it's better than a, a news alert coming out when you're telling people about something great that's happening this weekend. And so the emoji selector is embedded in each of these fields and has a ton of uh, different options for you to choose from uh, right in line in the system. Now, where are we gonna, what's the action we're gonna take when someone sends out this message? Well, you've got a handful of options now. Uh, you no longer have to go to uh, the admin mode of the widget to look for the ID associated with that place, event, or tour. You can simply select deep link and app, and then you can go ahead and just search. It's got a type ahead search functionality for the entity that you wanna link to. And when you do that, it pulls up your options. The events do include the event date. So if it's a recurring event, you can select the correct occurrence. And then at this point, um, you can specify if you want this to, to stay in the inbox, the notification inbox for that user for a day, for an hour, for a minute, um, or multiple minutes. And that's just going to dictate how long that message lives in the notifications inbox. And then lastly, you've got the option here to uh, either send this message out immediately or you can schedule it to go out at a specific time. So this event that's happening on the 25th, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just set this up to go out at 10 a.m. on the 25th, so we can um, make sure everybody gets out there and, and gets their tickets. Now, there's a couple different action options here. So one of them is deep linking in the app that will launch the app and take them straight to the, that view for the event that we just selected. You've also got the option to deep link to one of your menu items. So if this, if the contents of this message were check out all the great events happening this weekend, then I can just select the events menu item. And when people launch the app, it'll take them straight to the upcoming events as the default view. Um, you can launch the app. So if you just wanna fire the app up when people open it, you can do just that. You can link to a custom URL. So if this uh, particular event was ticketed, which it is, I can just pop in the ticketing URL and that's gonna open up a web view inside the app when people swipe the message, taking them to the, the ticket purchase page. And then lastly, uh, if you have a message that's over 140 characters, um, as everyone knows, these messages do start to truncate on the home screen of the app. But if you've got a, a pretty large message and you want people to be able to read all of it right when they swipe that, you can select open the notifications inbox that will launch the app and open, open the notifications inbox with the full contents of the message in view at that time. Um, and then once you've got a bunch of, of messages created, um, you know, you'll definitely want to schedule these. I, I think I hit the X. Uh, you can always come back and search for previous messages and, of course, duplicate them as needed. So that is the, the new messaging functionality. And we'll pause for questions. Yeah, I've got a question here from Joe Duran. Um, will you be able to send push no uh, notification tests like you can to on one signal? Yes, so some of the stuff that's coming soon on the push messaging tab of the command console is the analytics for past messages and ones you've just sent. Uh, the proximity messaging is it going to be another tab under push messaging where you can manage the geofence-based messages. In-app messaging, uh, where you can actually create the in-app messages that are not broadcast out, only shown when people launch the app. And then audience-based broadcast. And that's the audience-based is where we get into the users that we've set up as test users within one signal that you can send to yourself um, you know, prior to delivering to either a specific audience or all of your users. Thanks, Joe from MoCo. I appreciate that. All right. What was the recommended character count, including emojis for message notifications? About 140. Keep it short and sweet like a tweet, unless you do use the functionality where you open it directly into the inbox. So if you need to be more wordy, like let's say it was a PSA, something's going on where you have to send out a PSA um, and it needs to be more wordy, definitely push them opening within the inbox so that they can get the totality of that message. All right, Gene, what about proximity messaging? Good question. A very, uh, very astute there. So that is something that we're gonna be adding within this um, portion in the future, but keep in mind, you can still do proximity messaging on the widget itself uh, within the uh, uh, platform as it exists. So it's not like you're losing that functionality. You can still do it there, um, but we will be looking at that in, the in a future uh, iteration. 
Perfect. All right. So Katie, take us away on the user section. All righty. So previously you would have had to email one of us to get any sort of user report. Now within the new command console, you'll have access to not only export your own user reports, but also um, user check-ins and more. So let's walk through some of these new features. Starting at the top, you're gonna to see the search bar. You can search for a user's account by either email or username. You'll also see to the right of that, um, you can filter to a specific date range using that date picker. And then you'll also see the export CSV button. This is gonna allow you to export a full user report. And that exported report will come through as a CSV via email to the email address you're logged in with. So moving down to the list of users, you've got some category filters at the top. You can see um, name, email, check-ins. You've got arrows on them that you can toggle alphabetically. You can see under check-ins, you can actually click that number and a list will pop up to display all the places that the user, individual users checked it at. Under newsletter, it'll display any newsletters that a user subscribed to. And then lastly, when the account was created and updated. Then moving over all the way to the right-hand side, you're gonna see three little dots. This is where you'll have the ability to manually add check-ins or edit a user's role. So first let's go through the add a check-in. Let's say a user has a location setting turned off on their phone and they reached out to you because they visited a stop on a challenge that they're participating in um, and they couldn't check in. So this is an instance when you would utilize this feature. So once you click, you'll see the screen pop up and you can search for the place that you want to create that, create that check-in at. You notice some of them will have uh, multiple challenges under the places associated with one, more than one challenge or goal. From there, you'll just select the correct challenge like Eric did, you'll hit add at the very bottom once you've got all of your locations selected. And then under that check-ins area, you can see that it'll display your new locations that you've just manually added those check-ins to. The other feature you've got um, is gonna be the edit roles. Let's say you've got a new employee that you need to give admin access to. You're gonna do the same process as you would before where they create an account, but now you don't have to email us to get that admin access. You're just gonna check that little box right there, give them admin access, hit save. And now that user has admin access. We've also got some more features in this section coming like the ability to export a CSV report of an individual user's check-ins if you needed to send that to them. Um, but that sums up V1 of the user section of the command console. And here's the, uh, the export email with the user's information that will come to the email address you have set up as an admin. <clears throat> All right. So that takes us through the command console. Uh, it looks like there's a question from Sarah with Phoenix. Uh, so scheduling regular uh, reports is, is not something we have scoped out, but I'm gonna add that to my list because that's a great idea. So we'll set that up so you'll be able to schedule monthly, weekly, or whatever time period reports you guys uh, want to, and those will be delivered based on a job in the back end. So, uh, Jason uh, Hershiersberg, uh, worth asking, but we get some technology challenge users. Very PC. I like that. Can you allow us to manually add update user accounts? For instance, if they keep getting stuck at Apple ID login, we can create user at gmail.com and password help so they can log in and hopefully update their email. Yes, we... Uh... We already do have that capability to update users' emails, uh, not their passwords. We don't actually have access to their passwords because it's all encrypted, but we can at least, uh, you know, you'll be able to reset a password for a user and I can uh, make sure that you're also able to adjust the email address associated with that account. So great question. Uh, Joanne, this is one after my own heart right here. How do we connect newsletters to the user console? <laughs> 
Um, as of right now, I don't believe we have anything in the works to actually connect into, let's say, MailChimp or Constant Contact or some of those other resources that y'all are using. But it is something that we have kind of talked about, um, you know, putting on our roadmap uh, down the road because we know that there's a lot of value in having this data and these users here. So long term, um, and this is this is like I said, not even in the design element, but lo a lot of the stuff that I would like to see long term is the ability to to connect over to, um, let's say, whatever. Uh, you know, mail client you're using or not whatever with the few mail clients that you could be potentially be using and leveraging those lists to do drip campaigns. But Joanne, we do have the ability to have multiple newsletter checkboxes on the authentication screen in the widget in the apps. So you can, you know, automatically assign that person can pick that they want to be on XYZ newsletter and not on another newsletter. And that's what will show up here, what they subscribe to. So we can help you get that set up. And then Susan, uh, it, this is this is not fully live currently. The official launch date is November 1st, Friday of next week. And uh, there's a couple more bells and whistles that are being added before it launches. Uh, but you guys, everybody will have access and get, will notify the in, entire uh, portfolio of clients on the first when it's live and ready. Okay. So that gets us through the command console and at least its initial version. Um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about a major redesign that's uh, under being undergone for the widget. So basically, um, you know, we've always heavily invested in the platform and wanted to ensure that we were ahead of all of our competitors and always had the most interactive visit planning tool in the market. And uh, recently we started planning out a refactor and redesign of the widget, but as part of that process, we took um, a different approach on the design phase. We actually initiated user testing with over 30 different people that had never experienced the widget before. And we did think aloud studies with each of them, where basically we provided them with the widget interface and asked them what they thought it was, what they thought the intended, intended use of it was, what were its objectives and what would it help them do and had them kind of just explain what they felt and what they were attracted to and drawn to as they navigated the system. We got a lot of really interesting feedback and uh, it, it basically has led us down a path of uh, hyper focus on plan creation. So I'm going to show you some of the resulting uh, screens in a prototype of this new flow and this will not be plan based. This will be coming out for everybody. But basically, when you first launch the widget, you know, each client instance will, will maintain its branding and will work with anybody that we need to if we need a variations of your existing logos that will fit. But you're immediately presented with this initial screen talking about planning your trip to your destination. The menu items will be shown here so people get an idea of what all is included. And then we're prominently placing a create plan button that when you click, it's going to take you to a create plan modal. You can name your plan and you can optionally add dates for your plan, either a number of days or the specific dates that you're traveling. And once you create your plan, we're hitting them with one last view just to emphasize the add button that's present throughout the widget. And what you'll see here is some really major um, improvements to the overall interface. So first of all, the menu item icons are presented in a scrollable horizontal bar. So we're no longer going to be restricted to that tiny little space and squeezing in a bunch of menu item icons, uh, as we've seen with a lot of clients that really want granular navigation capabilities within the widget and the apps. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a more section here, and that's where you're going to be able to publish your client links, whether it's a chat bot or a weather information or a newsletter sign up directly in line in the widget, and those will open up inside a modal to whatever web view is specified. Now, if I start going through um, the list view here, you'll notice a couple of things are changing. The title of each of the items is no longer placed over the image, and that's a great improvement for both ADA compliance and WCAG, just having black text on a white background for extreme legibility. Um, you'll also notice that the add button is being placed in a much more prominent location, the top right, uh, so it stands out more and people get the idea that they're adding stuff to their plan. The image gallery is coming to the widget as part of this redesign, so you'll both have admin mode functionality in the command console to add images manually, or if you have your data source set up with multiple image URLs, we'll be syncing those in. 
and those will auto rotate through the images. And then lastly, um, you know, if I go to add something to my plan, what happens is we're showing a, a plan tooltip that basically uh, pulls up and shows you your plan items. And we're also prompting people to add your stay. So one of the primary areas of feedback that we received from our user testing was people wanted to find out where they were staying and then look for attractions and things to do within a certain proximity of their accommodation. And so you can now select find or add your stay. You'll be able to search through all the accommodations that we've synced from your data source or that are in your instance, um, or someone can drop a pin on the map. So if I select to drop a pin, that's gonna let me place my stay. I can save it and keep exploring. And at that point, the next big piece of user feedback we got is that idea of honing in on a particular area. So this will be on a per client basis, what we decide for the default uh, boundary, the, the radius of that area, but it is draggable by end users. So I could drag my radius to 10 miles or to two miles or whatever's you know, the amount of distance that I wanna travel from my hotel or accommodations to another location. And what that's gonna do is dictate the sort of the listings per menu item, showing me all of the prioritized items in a random order that are within that boundary first, followed by non-prioritized items within that boundary, then followed by prioritized items outside of that boundary, followed by non-priority items outside of that boundary. So really just allowing people to see, you know, where, what are the restaurants, what are the bars near my accommodations, where are the best zoo, you know, the, the best gardens and parks, um, so they can really hone in on how far they want to travel uh, during their trip. And then also, um, you'll notice on these listings here, if I reset this, a couple other improvements. Create plan. The uh, entity views are no longer going to be side by side where you always have uh, basically a duplicate cover photo side by side. And we're trying to maximize map space because that's what all of the users in our testing rounds uh, were really drawn to was the map interface. The overall entity detail views are being modernized substantially to match more of that in that you're seeing in the apps currently. And then if, uh, if you also notice the filters are being moved to be right in line with the list because we didn't want people to have to make the round trip from clicking on filters along the right-hand side for their interest categories and then coming back to view the listings and back and forth. So this will just be a modal with the categories displayed right there and the changes can be made right in line. We're also adding sort to the widget uh, listings. So the recommended sort is a combination of priority items and randomization and then non-priority items with randomization, but we'll also add the ability to have to sort nearby based on the menu item that I'm in and the categories I've selected, and then A to Z as well, just mirroring what you're currently seeing in the apps. So this is a, a major um, you know, redesign that's also taking into account the concept of creating multiple plans. So we want people to be able to create more than a single plan, and what you'll notice here is the My Plans tab is now going to be uh, set up in such a way that if someone goes on that trip, they can come back here later and create another trip for the next year when they want to go have a great time again in the same destination. So that is um, a quick sneak peek of what's coming down the, the roadmap for um, the widget interface. Are there any questions? Looks like Jeff has one. Yeah, it just says the new look of the widget loves it. Uh, multiple plans, great. Does the filter have check boxes for multiple selection? That's a good question. So, what we found was the the more modern filtering functionality isn't to have all of the filters selected and then people have to deselect all and then select one to get to that. So we're minimizing clicks here where. We'll have the listing showing up based on the categories that are enabled or disabled by default. But then when I actually select arts and culture or nightlife, it's going to automatically update the list with just arts and culture. If I selected two, it'll update the list with arts and culture and nightlife combined. So it minimizes one of the clicks for people to get to the filtered content they're looking for. When do you anticipate the new version of the widget uh, to go live? So I'm pushing on our dev team pretty hard. Um, I'm hopeful this is by end of the year, but I, I do think there's a chance it'll be in early Q1. Thanks. 
And yes, for any, uh, I'm answering a question via uh, just typing it out right now, but uh, for anybody that did show up late, or if you maybe have team members that want to see some of this stuff, we are recording this and we will be uh, posting it to our webpage. So I'll follow up with a link once that is live on our page via email. Good question. Perfect. All right. So um, the other thing I'll point out in terms of this deployment, it's going to be in phase deployment. So various components of this, the updated navigation across the top with the menu items will come first, followed by the list view redesign, followed by the your stay section and the whole create your plan onboarding flow. So you don't have to wait until all of this comes out. We're going to do it in such a way that we can get improvements out interstitially along the way to the final uh, end product. And then the last thing I've got to cover today is a fun one. This is uh, something that we're building that we're calling an AI plan builder. Everyone knows about all the big buzz around artificial intelligence these days. And so we are hopping on board instead of allowing uh, it to uh, crush us. So basically, uh, the AI plan builder is going to be exposed in the apps and the widget in multiple locations. You can, uh, an end user during the tutorials will have the option to plan their trip with AI. Or if they're in list views, there'll be an option to plan their trip with AI. And then again, in the My Plan view. And so basically what you're seeing here is once you select that, it opens up a date picker for your trip. You can either select the specific days or the amount of days that you want to travel to the area. You can select who you're traveling with, just me, partner, group, if you have kids in the group. And essentially what we're doing here is creating a query on Rails that's you know tra with a trained AI bot that's reading the database within our system that we have for your attraction. And as I go through the next one here, uh, what types of attractions are you interested in? These are what we call high level preferences and we'll work on this with a client by client basis. It's basically each one of these preferences can be associated with a number of categories in the back end of the system. And that's how we're basically going to go grab the entities related to the categories, the time frame, and the users group, travel group. So I select a handful of my preferences and I create my plan. We are requiring authentication um, in order to complete the AI trip planner because, first of all, we want to block any bot traffic that might try to ramp up our bill using the, the AI service. Additionally, it's just a great uh, account creation conversion feature to get more users in, in authenticated states. There will be a little animated state when the actual process is, is flowing. And then once it's completed, you've got a pre-planned trip and it includes um, you know, an introductory description about the trip. And then it's got the entities that we've lined up with the ones that are in our system from sinks or that have been manually created uh, with a certain number of activities per day. And at that point, end users can add individual items from the pre-planned trip to their plan, or they can save the entire plan. And again, you're seeing this concept of multi-plans where I can either add the AI-generated trip to one of my existing plans, or I can create a new plan, title it whatever I want, and save it. And at that point, we see the My Plan view, and we will have the AI-generated notes for each of the POIs added to the user's plan appended to the plan items. And this will eventually be editable as well, so the end users can add their own notes per plan item in addition to the AI-generated notes. This will be an add-on feature because there are um, additional um, you know, costs for us to leverage the, the open AI technology in order to build these plans. We don't have pricing finalized yet, but we will definitely announce that when it um, becomes available. Yep. So those were the two questions is, will the AI be a pro plan option, which Eric just answered, it's going to be an add-on option. And then, uh, you know, is it going to be included in all service plans? Again, it'd be an add-on option. We don't have pricing uh, at this time uh, finalized, but when we get ready to release it, we'll definitely, uh, we'll probably do another webinar uh, similar to this, going over everything, talking about that and, and really giving you all a lot more information at that point. What about time frame, Eric? So time frame for this is probably going to be Q1 because we are putting a lot of focus into the uh, widget redesign currently. The thing I'll note on the pricing, though, is we actually want to get this live on a couple client instances and actually see what kind of usage it does incur, because that's what's really going to drive, you know, how it's going to be priced out. If it is hugely successful, which is a great problem to have, um, we still need to know you know, what that cost, hard cost looks like to us, because it's a token-based system for the different AI queries. 
And uh, we've done some projections, but only time will tell once it's out in the wild how much usage it gets. So raise your hand if you want to just. <laughs> 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 All right, let's see. Lewis and Clark, Clark Trail here for AI. Can we have the ability to select geo limits, i.e., Montana, Idaho, Oregon? Good question. Great question. This is, you know, specifically mocked up for a single, uh, you know, municipality, a single city at this point. But we've got clients, countrywide clients, statewide clients, and uh, and we'll definitely have some different questions during that onboarding query um, for those types of clients based on their specific geographic area. All right. So um, without any more on AI, and feel free to send additional questions that they come up after the meeting. I'm going to pass the ball over to Nate. We've been working with Nate with um, a handful of clients and helping them source their events for their calendar so you, they no longer have to spend 40 hours a week being the, the steward of the community calendar, and it's pretty powerful technology. So we, we partnered with Nate in 2024 and have been uh, helping get this in the client's hands, and it helps keep the widget and the apps populated as well. So Take it away, Nate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, so yeah, I know a lot of you may be struggling with your event calendars and wishing that you had a team of people to basically be an extension of your own team and take this away. Um, so excited to walk you through how you can leverage this new partnership between Occasion Genius and Visit Widget and offload the work you do on your calendars, free up a lot of time. Um, so don't have to tell you too much about why events are important. <laughs> people are prioritizing these local experiences, travelers and locals alike. FOMO, fear missing out, we like to say is very real, but it's so hard to keep track of all the upcoming events. And uh, we hear this over and over from DMOs trying to put their calendar together and routinely keep up with it. Uh, just events are hard. So uh, the first problem is how do you know that the event's happening? You have to be searching for it. But then here are four other uh, considerations that uh, you, you might have felt the pain of. Uh, event organizers who post their events online don't understand uh, commercial copyright often for the images that they're posting. So since their images aren't copyright compliant, it's not okay to just take that image and put it onto your site. Event descriptions that organizers write are often all over the place. So they can be in all caps or there's no description or it'll say, join us, we'll be at. And that's very confusing for the Demos brand. So it means you have to rewrite a lot of these descriptions. And then there's a lot of events that are just junk events, 20% off Invisalign at a dentist office. Somebody needs to go through every event that's submitted or that's out there and identify the ones that are really leisure events open to the public. Um, then there are events that might be inappropriate. Is an event at a strip club, a gun expo? Okay, so you have to uh, be uh, looking at every event. And then the hardest part here for a human to do is events are dynamic. They get sold out, they're postponed, they're canceled. It's really poor user experience if you don't have somebody clicking on every link trying to find out if anything's changed to have old static links on your calendar um, and calendars become stale pretty quickly so if all this sounds familiar then <laughs> you're not alone these challenges are really just too much for a lot of um, people's calendar upkeep so they end up with calendars that look a bit like these they have no descriptions or really long and standardized descriptions they have no photos or sometimes photos irregular photos uh, it minimizes engagement um, so that's why we created Occasion Genius uh, right before the pandemic. Uh, and before working with Visit Widget, we've been working with dating apps, with tenant engagement portals, with marketing companies, as well as several large travel brands and hotels. So this is showing you, for example, Margaritaville Resorts, where our work presents itself uh, is a beautiful calendar inside of their booking engine that invites people to book their trip and stay an extra day. And so our secret sauce that we bring is we actually combine our technology with a crack expert US-based human editorial curation team that looks and enhances every event. And in fact, this is all that our company, Occasion Genius, does. Uh, we call ourselves an innovation and personalized event discovery tech. And we provide this power to events, to airlines, corporate and leisure providers, TMCs, hotel brands, and now through our partnership with Visit Widget to DMOs. So the way that our partnership works is Occasion Genius uh, is contracted to provide the events. And then Visit Widget is the one that takes our data and seamlessly integrates it into your own event calendars. So you get to work out with Visit Widget how the data will look in your environment. Ultimately, you have full control over that look and that feel by working with them directly. 
So here's how it works. First, you sign a contract that tells us what event parameters you have. So if you're a city, if you're a region, or if you're a state or something else, an association of distilleries. And you collaborate with us by providing us information about the venues that you want us to look at, the types of events that you'd like to have and also to avoid. Then our team hops in and aggregates those events. Those events, we use technology like integrations with ticketing companies like Eventbrite and uh, legal safe scraping with aggregators like Facebook events. And then we do manual sourcing from venues and websites. So really all the possible ways to find events we're agnostic to where the event comes from. Then our editorial team adds a unique high quality image with uh, full indemnification for all copyright issues. And we add them for every single event. And we'll actually write a, our own standardized and informative description using the third person uh, according to the Chicago Manual of Style Guidelines. So there's no confusion as to who's doing the talking and everything works together. Then lastly, our technology is constantly keeping track of events from their source pages. So making sure that we're tracking anything if it's canceled, postponed, sold out. And your calendar actually will update every day. So we're so excited that we've kicked off this partnership this year. We've already been working with Visit Widget in 2024, a long line of their clients that have expressed interest. Pricing starts at $300 per month. Uh, but please email Visit Widget to run a pricing analysis for you. So that will depend on the market, um, the quantity of events that you need or can expect, and if any special integrations might be needed on your end. Um, so with that, we'd love to take any questions that you have if you have any. Eric, you're muted. Justin, do you see any questions on? Oh, there we go. Yep, one just popped in. Is this compatible with WordPress sites? So maybe just touch on what it is compatible with, Nate. Uh, I think that'd be a great question with Eric. So the uh, way that it works is Occasion Genius is going to be providing our uh, data to uh, Visit Widget, and then Visit Widget will be in charge of uh, making it compatible with your site. Eric, anything you want to say on that end? Yeah, so WordPress, we've already set this up three different times. Um, we basically use WPL import. We ingest the data and we do some manipulations, like if there are exclusions for certain event types based on category, we work with the client directly on that. And then we provide an endpoint through WPL import that populates your calendar with these events and it runs on a daily basis to get any updates or changes. There are options to set it up within WordPress so that the events can be a draft status or published. Um, we can also set some of the sync settings to allow you to override if you had a specific image from the event organizer that you wanted to use in place of the cover photo, if you wanted to modify the description, have your own voice and tone, um, and even if you wanted to modify the dates because for some reason you know that the event occurs two days or something. But the source data, um, you know, already has all the occurrences and that kind of stuff, but we do have some settings to allow you a certain level of control on the events once they're inside WordPress. All righty. Joe is asking, does Occasion Genius find new events that are happening within a city or county? So we um, will, we recognize because our team, by the way, is all in the United States. We recognize that we don't live where you are. So you may know about some events that we don't. We make it really easy. If there's an event that you know about that we have not included, you can just send us the URL, that's it. You don't have to give us the name, the date, anything. You just shoot that off in an email and our team will include that. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what we do. We're looking for events. Um, typically, uh, it depends on what you need. Uh, we'll provide you the normal package is for two data sets. The first one is the biggest travel worthy events that are happening 12 months out. So if there's something that's happening several months out, we wanna make sure that it's included. And then we'll focus on the uh, all, all of the events uh, that are high quality events happening in the next 30 to 60 days. It, but if you need a different type of data set, you just let us know. And uh, we can also adjust as we work with you. All righty. So Jason is asking, where can we go to start develop a quote for our event scope? So what we'll do, Jason, is they'll do an analysis of your market. Um, so uh, we can get that uh, started for you. Um, I did take a note uh, to make sure we get that done for you. And then the second part of his question, is there an additional cost for integration above the contract? So oh, like a setup fee, is that what you're asking, perhaps, Jason? 
So, Jason, you I think um, you're referring to integration with uh, Simple View CRM. Is that accurate? I think that's probably yes, what that is. That is what he's asking. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we've already connected Occasion Genius with Simple View, and they have uh, ongoing discussions about a partnership on this front. And so there may be some initial integration costs to get it set up with Simple View, uh, but we can't answer that right now on the call, but we can definitely talk with you and, and your CSA about it. All right. Another question uh, from Chillicothe. How many sites can be scraped per account? So uh, there's no limit for how many sites can be scraped. We want to make sure that we're trying to find everything that's happening. Uh, the way our costs are really associated with how many events we enhance, meaning how many upcoming events do we have to find a great photo for, write a description for, add our event genome or flags for. Um, so monitoring and keeping up to date is not a cost consideration. It's how many events are actually in your area. For events that, for markets that have a lot of events going on, but only have a budget for a certain amount, what we can do is give you a best events uh, a data set which is our team will look at all the events happening and only enhance the ones that we think are the best, the most eyebrow raising, the most engaging and the most exciting. So we really have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we work with you based on your budget. Perfect. A uh, couple of clients uh, that we have live now that they can uh, take a peek at. Uh, we're just rolling out with Visit Widget. And uh, so uh, maybe Eric, you can send them some follow-ups um, and yeah. some links. We'll also provide Visit Widget with a couple links where you can see our data in action as well outside of the Visit Widget uh, integrations. But we will send some 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 of the clients that are live currently their event calendars in the uh, the follow up with the recording. One quick note on that: um, because you will still have the ability to add your own events. You may see some pictures there uh, or descriptions that don't represent Occasion Genius's product or work, just because it was added by the um, uh, uh, by the uh, uh, DMO itself. So uh, to keep that in mind. We'll try to we'll try to give Visit Widget a couple of things for you to look at so that you can understand the type of quality that we're providing. So this is uh, Kevin Campbell out of Indian Lakes, Ohio. Uh, can I sign up for a partic for particular months since we are a seasonal area? That's a new one, but we'd love to work something out with you guys. Um, I, that should be doable. Yeah, just reach out to me, Kevin, and we can talk about that. Uh, anonymous attendee, how does this compare to ITI digital events calendar? So a lot of... Uh, Visit Widgets clients who have been using ITA, ITI have reached out to us to make a change. What we've been hearing in terms of feedback is that ITI was exclusively Facebook uh, events. So they were missing a lot of events that were not on Facebook. Uh, and they also weren't providing all of the events that were available on Facebook. So for example, one of the DMOs shared with us that for Martin Luther King uh, Jr. weekend, they had no Martin Luther King Day events, and that reflected really poorly on the on the DMO itself. Um, so I, all we've heard is that it's more expensive, and it's not the only thing that ITI Digital does. They actually provide a host of other products, and as I mentioned, this is the only thing that Occasion Genius does because events are so difficult and hard. Um, we've actually raised several million dollars just to do this one particular thing. And so I think that's the big difference is that we're really the experts in a premium event data set, whereas other companies might be offering something that they feel would be good enough. But the feedback we've gotten is good enough, not good enough <laughs> for the DMOs. Yeah. And then Thomas uh, with Southern Arizona Attractions Alliance sounds like an opportunity to develop a master calendar for all in our region. I mean, the great things about Occasion Genius is they will, you know, scour all of the events in your region and really find anything that you think is meaningful and beneficial to be added to your events calendar. So you've got a lot of control to really pull in um, what it is that, you know, fits your audience's needs and uh, work closely with the OG team to ensure that those are being met and delivered. All right, guys, we have about three minutes left. Um, if there's any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them um, in the next couple minutes, and we'll just hang tight and kind of keep our eyes up here. 
we do want to say thank you so much for attending. Uh, it's it's been uh, um, you know something we've been excited about wanting to show everybody, and so we're excited on November first to get this live for everybody, um, and then continuing our hard work, the development team in the background that you don't ever get to see their faces. They're uh, you know really excited as well to get these products out to you. It's stuff that they've been working very very hard on, spending tons of hours on, and uh, we just want you to know we're continuously delivering for you every single time, even though you don't see it all the time. This is the stuff that we're working on to make sure our product is developed through years to get better and better to service your needs, provide better analytics for you, provide better support for you and make a better experience for your visitors while they're in market. And based on the amount of participation on this webinar, we will be doing these more often uh, to keep everybody updated with all the great stuff that we're working on. Yep. Awesome. I'm not seeing anything else coming in. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate you attending. All right. Awesome, folks. Well, I hope you have a beautiful day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for attending. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.